here. Um, welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Chapter Society of Architectural Historians lecture, um, where we are presenting Professor Daniel Abramson um, from the Boston from the uh, from Boston University. Um, he received his BA in English and American Literature from Princeton University and his PhD in Art History from Harvard University. He's currently the Director of Architectural Studies at Boston University, um, and he previously taught at Tufts University and Connecticut College. His research focuses on economic society and architecture from the 18th through the 20th centuries with a specialization in British and American material. He is the author of three books, Obsolescence and Architectural History by the published the University of Chicago Press in 2016, Building the Bank of England, Money, Architecture, Society from 1694 to 1942, published through Yale University Press 2005, and Skyscraper Rivals, the AIG Building and the Architecture of Wall Street um, through Princeton Architectural Press 2001. He is also the co-editor of Governing, Governing by Design, Architecture, Economy, and Politics in the 20th Century through University of Pittsburgh Press 2012. His talk tonight is on his latest book, Obsolescence, which examines architectural responses to planned obsolescence. Uh, it has been widely reviewed, including in the Times Literary Supplement and most recently in the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians. He is also a founding director of the Aggregate Architectural History Collaborative, a group dedicated to advancing research and education in the history and theory of architecture. His current research projects include one examining the Boston State Service Center in relation to the American welfare state, and another on narrative and evidence in architectural history. Please help me in welcoming Professor Daniel Abramson. Thank you, Kelsey, for that nice introduction. It's a real honor um, for me to be here as an architectural historian being at the University of Virginia, this sacred ground. Uh, not just for the buildings, but also for the tradition here of really outstanding architectural history. Um, so, um, as I said, honored to be able to share uh, some of this work um, that I've recently been doing, and also especially to have a chance to talk about it at a school of architecture, um, where I think this is not just a matter of historical perspective, um, but hopefully of some uh, contemporary relevance. Um, so, my talk today is in effect, an architectural history um, of obsolescence, where the idea comes from that buildings and cities can rapidly lose their value and utility and so become expendable, and how architects and others responded to the perception that this process of architectural obsolescence characterizes modernity. Um, can I have the lights down? Yes. That will work. At the same time, this project about obsolescence addresses an open question about capitalism posed by the eminent historian Eric Hobsbawm, who asked, how is it then that humans and societies structured to resist dynamic development come to terms with a mode of production, and by that he means capitalism, a mode of production whose essence is endless and unpredictable dynamic development? It is my argument here this evening that an architecture's confrontation with obsolescence are answers to Hobsbawm's question of how people come to terms with the contradiction between, on the one hand, capitalism's endless change, and on the other, the deep human need for constancy. I'll begin with the invention of the idea of obsolescence itself. The term was first applied in English to architecture about a century ago to help explain the unsettling phenomena of American downtown skyscrapers, recently built and still physically sound, but now brought low by a process of what was first called financial decay, and then obsolescence. Experts like the New York engineer Reginald Bolton sought causes for obsolescence's sudden losses of value in factors of urban change, technology and fashion, something new and better, outcompeting the old and making it expendable. Bolton tabulated obsolescence rates by building types. Banks, for example, holding their value longer than hotels due to apparently different rates of change in use and taste. Now you can see that the shortest like 
life building here is something called a taxpayer. So this was a building that would be built with the idea that it would simply be present for a short period of time, taking the place of a larger building that was no longer making a lot of rental income. And instead, what the owner would do would be to demolish that larger building and build something smaller with the idea that it would pay the taxes for a short period of time until more lucrative opportunities would come along. And you oftentimes see at the corners of American cities, small buildings like this. This is a taxpayer that lasted more than 12 to 15 years. Also, it's the reason that you'll see parking lots oftentimes surviving longer than you might be expected. They're just there to pay the property taxes until someone comes along to develop the site and um, profit from it to a greater degree. Now, the author of that treatise that I was talking about, Reginald Bolton, interestingly, was also an active historic preservationist, conducting archaeological digs, writing books about New York's past, and joining the recently founded American Scenic and Historic Preservation Society. So it was that in both aspects of Bolton's life, obsolescence expert and preservationist, he endeavored to steer modernization to preserve existing values, be they financial in terms of office buildings obsolescence or cultural, trying to preserve those values. Further impetus for studying architectural obsolescence after Bolton was given in the mid-19-teens by the new US federal income tax, which allowed deductions from income for the cost of obsolescence. It is the idea that if your building lost value, that was a cost of doing business. But the income tax code did not specify exact rates of deduction, that is, at what percentage um, per year you could deduct it. Instead, as is typical in the United States, the um, tax bureaucrats left it up to private industry to come up with the numbers that they thought was appropriate. The Chicago-based National Association of Building Owners and Managers oops, now set about investigating the matter. So-called autopsies of demolished Chicago landmarks identified as causes of obsolescence, for example, on the right, the Tacoma Building's inefficient layout with those structural internal walls, and in the center, the Marshall Field Wholesale Store's inadaptability to retail use. What happened when that district in Chicago was no longer the wholesale center? This building with its heavy, thick masonry base and foundation could not be adapted for retail use. That is, you couldn't put large plate glass windows in there, so the building was obsolete. Statistics assembled here from Chicago's Loop District, supported the case for office buildings 30-year lifespans. You can see what they've done in the image on the left is they've taken some recently demolished buildings and figured out that buildings are now going to only average 32 years of life. And on the right, what they've done is they've averaged out all of the Chicago buildings in the Loop uh, to come up with even a shorter li average lifespan. This, the case they were trying to make, the building owners, was that 30-year lifespans were reasonable for tax purposes. That is about a 3% deduction taken each year. The building owners and managers just about got their wish when federal authorities set office building lifespans at 40 years. The political achievement here had been to turn the extreme cases of Chicago's obsolescence rates into low building lifespan numbers for the benefit of owners nationwide. This was, in effect, a public subsidy for private reinvestment, unique to the world's tax codes at this time and characteristic of political economy. Social policy and economic policy in the United States often runs through the tax code, as we're realizing now with efforts to reform it. In Britain, by contrast, for example, at this time, that had no tax deductions for building obsolescence, there was no similar discourse on architectural obsolescence. The cultural achievement of the real estate capitalist discourse on architectural obsolescence, as evidenced by numerous newspaper, magazine, and professional journal articles, as well as this cartoon from Collier's Magazine, 
was to help establish an American public consciousness the myth of shortened building lifespans as an inevitable feature of modern life. That is what it says here. The wrecker is an important, important person today, as if all buildings will inevitably be destroyed. This was mythic, of course, because buildings don't magically disappear at 40 years of age. Their fates are not predetermined or biological, but based instead on the contingent uncertainties of changes in fashion and feeling, politics and technology. What the paradigm of architectural obsolescence invented by real estate capitalists did do was to make sense of unsettlingly changeful times. The idea of obsolescence, to use the historian Hobsbawm's phrase, helped people to come to terms with capitalism's otherwise chaotic process of redevelopment, making it seem logical, beneficent, profitable, even progressive. Rapid demolition, reinvestment, and rebuilding now had a name, obsolescence. An architectural analog, in effect, to the economist Joseph Schumpeter's famous mid-century definition of capitalism as creative destruction, new, constantly superseding old. Subsequently, the paradigm of architectural obsolescence expanded its domain beyond its American business inventors' intentions to the more general urban and social realms worldwide. From the 1930s through the 1950s, appeared numerous references to the obsolescence of cities. In Europe, urban lifespans were projected at some 80 years. That is the notion that whole cities were going to be rebuilt within a few generations by the Swiss planner Hans Bernoulli. And pre-war East German tenements were deemed obsolete, not in a developing capitalist society, but obsolete in terms of an evolving socialist society. In America, urban obsolescence denoted substandard economic and also public health performance. We see the title of this plan of Boston's West End neighborhood denoting it obsolete. And this type of obsolescence was quantifiable by appraisal forms in physical and social terms. Assessors would go block to block, building to building, apartment to apartment, counting how many people lived there, how many windows were broken. They'd study rates of public health um, uh, outcomes. And if a neighborhood like Boston's West End garnered a certain number of penalty points, then it would be denoted obsolete and thus slated for demolition and capitalist reinvestment. That is, you had to do these assessments in order to free up federal urban renewal dollars. If a neighborhood was bad enough and obsolete, then it would be demolished, as the West End was. So prominent was this idea of a traditional urbanism outmoded by modern planning and suburbanization that in 1959, the Ford Foundation could declare, quote, the physical city, as it has existed for hundreds of years, is becoming obsolescent. By the 1950s, then, the notion of architectural obsolescence in all its contexts, varieties, and scales, from capitalist to socialist, America to Europe, office buildings to cities, had become a dominant paradigm worldwide for conceptualizing and managing change in the built environment especially in consumer cultures, charmed by notions of planned obsolescence and expendable commodities. Shortened building lifespans and obsolescent cities became myths of modernity, infusing everyday experience with the dominant values of capitalism and making capitalist change, its creative destruction, seem completely normal and natural. As James Marston Fitch said, they become the norms. And I would argue obsolescence differed from past paradigms of urban and architectural change. Unlike, for example, the 19th century explicitly political redevelopment of Paris under Baron Haussmann, 20th century urban obsolescence appeared technocratic and impersonal, a matter of, a matter of inevitable economic law. Moreover, obsolescence's fast, unceasing ruptures 
the idea that the built environment would be regenerated within your lifetime, departed from architecture's traditional ideal of slow, organic development, epitomized by the ruinscape and the continuity between past and present. Obsolescence was thus a new framework for comprehending change with which architects still had to come to terms. How did they respond? At first, by denial. Traditionalists and avant-gardists alike, early in the 20th century, held fast to permanence and finish as paramount values. Gropius might have been designed in a style that rejected tradition, but he did say that he was aiming at standards of excellence, not creating transient novelties. That is, he didn't imagine that his own buildings would become obsolete. Notwithstanding the 1914 Futurist Manifesto's call for, quote, expendability and transience, unquote, the designs on the left of Antonio Santalia, the designs themselves appear massive and immutable, that they'll be unchanging and not obsolescent. A few outsiders did recognize opportunities. Buckminster Fuller's craned components were inspired by automobile annual model changes. You'd be able to crane in and out the components of your apartment as rapidly as you might change cars. In Europe, the Czech shoe manufacturer, Tomas Baccia, explicitly projected 20-year lifespans for the factories and houses of his famed company town of Zlín. But designers only began to deal seriously with obsolescence in the post-war period. Some architects accepted obsolescence's promise, its premise rather, its promise of liberation from the past and eventually the present too. British critic and historian Rainer Banham began in the 1950s promoting what he called an aesthetics of expendability for the ages throwaway economy. Fellow Britain Richard Llewellyn Davies organized research at the University of London that analyzed hospital departments' different obsolescence rates, which is what you see on the left there, and theorized generally obsolescence's trajectory in that image on the right. The idea that a building architecture's index of performance will constantly be declining over time unless the building can be rebuilt. By the 1960s, most everyone believed that obsolescence ruled the day. The quotations here are typical comments, none especially insightful. It's basically one banal cliche after another. It was in design, not in words, that architects engaged most deeply with obsolescence. The prime design solution to obsolescence was the open plan factory shed internal adaptability versus unforeseen change in fixed structural shells. This model was also adapted for schools and offices and also for labs and hospitals when stacked vertically with what were called interstitial service levels. The idea on the right being that these clear, that these habitable floors could have their partitions be rearranged according to new developments, for example, in the delivery of medical services, but that all of that complicated technology could also be re relocated by having all the services up here, and they too could be moved around. All discussions of flexibility at this time were in effect worries about obsolescence. A cultural variant of this interstitialism, that is the division of service areas from served areas. A cultural vari variant was Par Paris's Pompidou Center, which externalizes and verticalizes its service zone for obstruction-free exhibition lofts. Berlin's new National Gallery submerges the everyday functions beneath its podium, leaving above ground the apotheosis of the factory shed solution to obsolescence. Here, change is absorbed within a fixed monumental frame. 
representing one architectural way to come to terms with ceaseless change, to admit its freedoms internally within this exhibition space, but contained within this fixed permanent shell. Other architects, however, rejected the factory shed solution to obsolescence as too fixed and monumental and thus unrepresentative of modern dynamism. And that instead they promoted more open form. Thus, the largest British medical complex of its day, Northwick Park Hospital, possesses a loose jointed site plan reflecting the research on hospital growth rates conducted by its architects, Richard Llewellyn Davies and John Weeks. The idea here was that if different hospital units were going to change at different rates, then you had to allow them to grow separately. If they were all contained within one fixed frame, then how can they possibly grow then? So this building then features what were called growing ends, right? So what you're seeing on the left here is in effect a cut section of the building in which those fire stairs are demountable, as are the metal panels, so the, the complex could grow. And you could also demolish some of those individual units without disrupting the function and form of the overall whole. Thus, the building can flex with obsolescence's contingencies. The architects called this indeterminate architecture, forever unfinished. And yet there is permanence here too, as the architects conceived it, in the fixed internal corridor system, here and here. This would always remain the same, even as the complex as a whole changed. So there is a modicum of constancy here amidst impermanence. Permanence and impermanence harmonized in an age of obsolescence was the theme, too, of the megastructure, which featured long-life frame and short-life capsule constructions, a type associated particularly with Japanese architects. One of the so-called metabolist group, Noriaki Kurokawa, focused particularly upon imaging the megastructure's joints, as we see in the image on the right, and also in this detail of the capsule tower where he's concerned most about how will those short life capsules be attached and detached from the long life frame. The joint is the key detail where these two temporalities, the fast and the slow, conjoin. In effect, it's the spatial transition of obsolescence. Another architect, Peter Cook, in his plug-in city projects, sought to fix in architecture not the spatial, but the temporal transition of obsolescence, that moment in time when function falters and value is lost. A 16-frame analysis of an imaginary plug-in university's growth and adaptation, note how that analysis goes blank in frame number 12. Here, architectural imaging fails. It is text instead that points to a vaguely defined trend that obsolesces the university as it becomes a broadcasting center. Cook's plug-in experiment discovers architecture unable to represent obsolescence, to fix its image. Obsolescence remains elusive outside the frame, beyond design representation. It can only be articulated in text. Architecture confronts a limit of its mid-century engagement with obsolescence. The limits of obsolescence were also being sensed in a project by Cedric Price, another Briton who was so enamored of expendability that he officially joined the National Institute of Demolition Contractors. He loved the idea that his buildings would not last very long. Here, Price imagines an academic network set amidst England's post-industrial ruins. This is an image of continuous expendability and replacement. The idea is that along these abandoned rail lines, capsules will be hoisted in and out for the academic and housing units. It's a, a vision of architecture simultaneously under construction and being demolished. Yet the most substantial objects 
in this other view of Price, Pottery, Stinkfeld are not the futuristic capsules or ghostly housing modules in the mid-ground, but rather the stubborn remainders of the past, the background looming slag heaps, the foreground derelict shed. Price seems to understand that in a world governed by expendability and obsolescence, that the undead waste of the past will come to haunt the promise of that future. Others besides Price in the 1960s were starting to question obsolescence's logic and promise of endless expendability, this mode, this very particular mode of comprehending and managing change. Social scientists disclosed people's traumas of obsolescence studying the consequences of the demolition of Boston's West End. The urban writer Jane Jacobs famously argued that cities need old buildings. Time makes certain structures obsolete for some enterprises, and they become available for others. Culturally, obsolescence came to stand not for progress, but inauthenticity and waste. The journalist Vance Packard satirized the cornucopia city of the future, where all buildings will be made of special paper mache, torn down and rebuilt every spring and fall at house cleaning time. And Volkswagen marketed its Beetle as immune to the superficial styling and planned obsolescence of American car makers. Their car would stay the same year to year. In architecture, too, protest arose against obsolescence's depredations. Vernacularism celebrated everyday architecture, which, as the Museum of Modern Arch Museum of Modern Art exhibition catalog proclaimed, quote, everyday architecture does not go through fashion cycles. That is, it is not subject to obsolescence. Architects like the German photographers, the Bechers, revalued the obsolete remnants of industrial civilization in Europe. Likewise, historic preservation advanced intensively in the 1960s. Before the mid-20th century, preservationism and obsolescence had coexisted more or less peaceably, both in fact being two sides of the same modernizing coin, rationalizing change in elite interests. It is hardly coincidental that the first great theorist of architectural obsolescence, Reginald Bolton, embraced both obsolescence and preservation. But from around 1960, preservationism evolved against obsolescence's depredations, especially toward the recent past, and came to enjoy popular support. In Italy, the Communist Party in Bologna even rallied to the slogan, preservation is revolution. How did architects respond to these reversals of obsolescence, these resistances to its logic of ceaseless change? First, they sought new images of permanence against obsolescence's transience. Here, inflexible, archaic, concrete monoliths represent, as one commentator wrote about Paul Rudolph's designs, quote, they are the refutation of the artificial obsolescence theory held by planners of disposable cities, unquote. Concrete brutalism became a worldwide vernacular in the 1960s and 1970s versus obsolescence. In another vein, architectural postmodernism revalued historical imagery. Italian architect Aldo Rossi sought to recreate what he called the primary elements of the past, strong abstract iconic symbols indifferent to function, as Rossi wrote, like ghostly ruins already and therefore immune to future obsolescence. Adaptive reuse also became a dominant strategy to revalue ostensibly obsolete buildings. Stripped volumes housed new fittings, emblematic brick walls embodied soft change versus the hard traumas of obsolescence. At the urban scale, adaptive reuse largely means gentrification, the elevation of an area's social and economic status 
and a variation on urban renewal. Gentrification and adaptive reuse reverse obsolescence's logic of demolition, but not its social and political effects. The buildings may still be intact, but the marginalized inhabitants are no less gone. And of course, environmental architecture has come to the fore, conserving rather than expending existing resources, first through salvage, and now with highly sophisticated technology. Today's architectural vanguard, like this German demonstration project built on reclaimed land with renewable materials, featuring a high-tech system of energy efficiency under glass. Indeed, what we call today sustainability could be said to encompass all the counter tactics to obsolescence, from vernacularism and adaptive reuse to postmodernism, preservationism, and environmental design. All of these prioritized the conservation rather than expendability of resources, both natural and human made. The richness of 1960s architectural culture precisely reflected the passions of a contest over obsolescence still hanging in the balance, the two sides equally creative and fervid. Multiple architectures accepted obsolescence's inevitability and promise. These were ways, pragmatic and lyrical, to manage and design Hobsbawm's contradiction between capitalism and constancy, to find ways to accommodate both dynamism and fixity fast and slow change together. On the other side, preservationism, vernacularism, adaptive reuse, concrete brutalism, postmodernism, and green design rejected obsolescence as expectations of fast-paced change and refused its inevitability. These counter tactics exploited obsolescence as internal contradictions. They redeemed its leftover waste and accounted for suppressed feeling unmeasurable by performance quantifications. In the 1960s, the contest between these two attitudes towards obsolescence was, were more or less equal, I think. Things might have gone either way. Passion and imagination were intense in both camps. But by the early 1970s, the matter was largely settled. Designing for obsolescence lost its hold over the cultural imaginary top-down technocratic decision-making alienated popular feeling, as in the reaction to the urban renewal of Boston's West End. Financial constraint in the wake of oil crises dried up resources for constant replacement. Urban unrest eroded public patronage for renewal. Awareness of Earth's fragility underscored obsolescence's profligacy wastefulness. And preservation claimed important victories, as in 1976, when the U.S. tax code began subsidizing historic rehabilitation over demolition. And the UNESCO World Heritage Convention, adopted in 1972, continues its global march up to the present time. The grand dreams of a throwaway, expendable future Founded on the shoals of economic, political, and cultural reversals. Today, it would seem, we live in the world the 1970s left us, not exuberant expendability, but careful conservation. In a word, the age of sustainability. Seeing obsolescence and sustainability in sequence points to obsolescence as part in the genealogy the prehistory of sustainability. But we should not see obsolescence and sustainability as completely separate. The relation between the two is as much filial as agonistic. Adaptive reuse, for example, is a variation on the megastructure. In both, new components are inserted into long life frames to accommodate change. Obsolescence and preservation are also mutually intertwined. Both define the past as broken off from the present, and they need each other to survive. As historian David Lowenthal writes, quote, 
to expunge the obsolete and restore it as heritage are like disease and its treatment, conjoined and even symbiotic, unquote. And obsolescence and ecological architecture mirror each other too in their dependence upon measurable performance. Today's tables of building energy use echo the data mania of earlier obsolescence studies. In both approaches, architectural value and worth is reduced to experts' numbers. Obsolescence thus endures, even if not as a dominant worldview. In design, obsolescence no longer drives innovation as it once did, when architects experimented imaginatively with factory sheds and indeterminacy, megastructures and plugins. Only occasionally today does contemporary architecture grant creative significance to obsolescence. Rem Koolhaas is an exception. Trained in late, late 1960s London, Koolhaas retains that moment's romance with obsolescence and refights energetically its battles against preservation, right, with these hyperbolic comments about how preservation is taking over the world. Koolhaas's unrealized plan for Paris's La Défense district decreed, quote, that every building in this entire zone that is less than 25 years old has to be destroyed, unquote. In practice, Koolhaas expresses his embrace of obsolescence in smaller scale details, as at the Illinois Institute of Technology Campus Center, whose elements, especially up in the ceiling, look under construction, still provisional expendable. We can see obsolescence enduring too in America's older inner suburban towns where Main Street preservation cohabits with ruthless domestic teardowns, capes for McMansions, the selective obsolescence of post-war suburbia. In China, capitalist modernization today sweeps away the past, echoing the American trajectory a century ago and yet there are important differences between Chicago and Shanghai. Unlike in mid-20th century America, when the centralized, dense city form itself seemed to have been obsolesced by suburbia, Chinese cities are as dense as ever and exhibit, too, survivals from the past, as in this other Shanghai image from the roof of a rehabbed 1930s slaughterhouse looking over other adaptive reuses to the left, surviving tenements in the mid-ground and postmodern additions to the right, as well as new modern towers. In other words, our time remains, as lived experience always is, polytemporal, in sociologist Bruno Latour's term, and in this view of Shanghai. Always new and old together, coexisting obsolescence and sustainability. If obsolescence then was the dominant ideology of change for mid 20th century capitalism, rationalizing and giving a name to its process of wholesale expendability, then arguably sustainability performs the same function for capitalism today. It may be going too far to declare, as does philosopher Adrian Parr, that, quote, sustainability culture is inherent to the logic of late capitalism, unquote. But the symbiosis is evident. Capitalism, which sired obsolescence a century ago, today generates profits from sustainability. Eco-branding proves effective marketing, as any visit to a Whole Foods store attests. And as much as sustainability promises a new, brighter future, can it ever break the current order when sustainability's abiding ethic is not radical change, but rather continuity, conservation, and an ideal net zero equilibrium? As architect Ellen Grimes has asserted, sustainability is, quote, an inherently conservative term, unquote. Might, in fact, sustainability be merely an alibi of conservation, its practice in architecture as profligate as obsolescence, 
witness super tall skyscrapers for Jakarta, Mumbai, and Shanghai trumpeting their lead certifications. In other words, sustainability no less than obsolescence is ideological. Productive for design to be sure, firing architects' imaginations as obsolescence once did, but nevertheless rife with illusion and contradiction. What then are some lessons from the architectural history of obsolescence? First, the architectural history of obsolescence illustrates the flexibility of capitalism, its capacity to evolve from its own contradictions. What capitalism itself obsolesced, the industrial age built environment, it then revalued through adaptive reuse, gentrification, and historic preservation. All that was solid need not melt into air to be profitable again architectural history teaches us. The architectural history of obsolescence also demonstrates the value in a vibrant architectural culture of the impulses both for accepting extreme transformations and resistance to it. This was the characteristic struggle of the 1960s. Today, the impulses stand imbalanced, sustainability in the ascendant, obsolescence eclipsed. In Hong Kong, at the Asia Society Center building, a new steel-columned walkway runs at a respectful distance from a restored, massive masonry wall. The past is a precious jewel here, set off from the present and the future. Less refined, but more instructive, and expressive of the lessons of obsolescence is the temporality of a renovated factory building in the Czech Republic. Here in Zlín, a century ago, the shoe manufacturer, Tomas Batya, imagined 20-year building lifespans, as you may remember from a few moments ago. In 2006, the frame of building number 23 was refurbished as a business innovation center. The building has also been augmented to the right with a new projecting bronze bay. But more significant, something has been subtracted from the architecture at the top. To lighten the structure, broad voids appear in the upper floors, thus shrinking the historical frame. Bacha's intention, a limited life architecture, is honored unconsciously. Building number 23 treats history, history flexibly, not reverentially. The past is visibly released. The present is open, as implicitly is the future too. Here then are lessons from the age of obsolescence for today, showing how to preserve memory and facilitate growth at the same time. This then is an answer to Hobbesbaum's question how we come to terms under capitalism and in architecture with these contradictory temporalities, these different speeds, fast and slow, together. Perhaps the most general lesson of the architectural history of obsolescence is that narratives of the change are themselves changeable creations. Obsolescence, then sustainability. Both were historically invented, possess exploitable contradictions, and can be historically reversed. Something else may come after sustainability, another worldview for comprehending and managing change in the built environment. One candidate might be resiliency, defined as, quote, the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance. Like sustainability, resilience perceives existential environmental threats, but not sustainability's idealization of equilibrium. That is, in resilience thinking, there's always going to be some new crisis. Rather, and like this, resilience then, like obsolescence, imagines a future of constant, radical, unpredictable change. In any event, the best lesson 
from the history of obsolescence may be to accept the essential unmanageability of change, the futility of so many efforts to ward off obsolescence in design. Our futures ought not to be considered ironclad, but rather malleable and contingent, as unpredictable and potentially liberating as obsolescence itself. There is still much to learn from obsolescence in architecture and in our lives, to learn to live with change and to accept and even come to welcome endings. Thank you very much. Yes, sure, yep, yep, I can, yep. So the idea was that obsolescence as a loss in value was something totally separate from the decay of materials. So there were even kind of different accounting terms for that. Depreciation was a fixed rate of a loss of value that was completely predictable based on how fast, you know, wood or brick or paint would decay. And obsolescence was something else. That is, it was something external to the fabric of the building, that some new invention that would come along and devalue what you had. Um, and that was seen as being an accelerated process of devaluation. So for example, um, you, know, you might have a steam engine that was working perfectly well and in material terms uh, was functional, but it would be obsolesced by an electric engine. So uh, uh, they're actually was, were perceived as very separate um, uh, from an accounting perspective and also now from this architectural perspective. Does that answer? Yes. Um, so that was seen as one of those factors that um, would, as a cause of obsolescence, already back 100 years ago when Bolton was writing, he recognized that your office building uh, could suffer from financial decay if people's change in lobby decor or the external style of a building was no longer fashionable and they would want to move to a more modern building and you couldn't get the rents you wanted anymore. But again, that's unpredictable um, and it's something external to the physical fabric of the building. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, um, I was making the case that it was real estate capitalist businessmen who invented the idea of architectural obsolescence. Um, at least to the, it wasn't that people hadn't thought that buildings might pass away in a generation or so, you know, but it was, it was seen as something weird and deviant. So for example, um, Daniel Hawthorne's House of the Seven Gables, there's reference to the fact that you know buildings might disappear in a generation. But this is uttered by a character who um, is very contrary early in the book, and then later on he rejects that whole notion because and settles down. Um, but what, from an economic perspective, from an accounting perspective, um, the invention of this idea was a way to make sense and to regularize what was being seen as happening every day in the business world, which was your asset could unpredictably lose its value very suddenly. This had to be taken account of by accountants, say for insurance purposes or valuation purposes. But then this was nationalized by the introduction of the federal income tax, which allowed business owners to take what they were doing in accounting terms and apply it to the tax code. And also it made sense then it was, as I said, a word that explained what was otherwise inexplicable. How could a building that was 12 years old and perfectly functional be demolished? 
when people said, oh, it was obsolete. Then all of a sudden, you have a word for it and it makes sense. So I do think that it was invented out of an economic context, but it only takes hold when it offers up an explanation that's cultural. Does that answer your question? And then architects have to, re then architects respond to it. Yes. So that's a good question. The term obsolescence was used much more sparingly in Europe. It was never really used in relationship to buildings before the Second World War, in part, I believe, because the tax code didn't allow it in, in Europe, and so there ne wasn't people talking about it. After the war, um, with, the demo with the destruction, because of the war, Europeans were not interested in, as you're, I think, implying, the kind of designating areas obsolete and rebuilding them. Um, it wasn't that there wasn't urban renewal in Europe, um, but they didn't use those economistic terms quite so much. I think also the reason was that in Europe, the renewal of those cities was not taking place in a market context as it did in the United States, but it was in effect the state was leading the way. And so it did, they were, the urban renewal was for social purposes, whereas in the United States, the urban renewal, even if it was partially funded through the government, was basically turned over to the market. So there was much less a sense of an economic context for rebuilding in Europe. So besides the traumas of the war and a desire to perhaps reinstate what had existed before, there just wasn't that same economic framework. Um, it was the public sector that was more involved in rebuilding. So I think the way that the change in the built environment is perceived, um, I do think there are different national contexts for that. Um, you know, a more conventional way is to say, well, Europeans value the past more, or the Japanese are more comfortable with impermanence um, because of uh, certain cultural factors. I think what I felt was interesting was not to look at um, those uh, very vague terms, but to look at things like the tax code, which generated a way of thinking about the built environment by producing this discourse that then had a very particular, I think, influence in the United States. Um, then in England, interest in obsolescence and that obsolescence research was funded in a different context. In the United States in the early 20th century, it was um, the real estate organization. In the Second World War, after the Second World War in England, it was a different political economy. It was the British state, the welfare state, that wanted to make efficient investments in hospital building, that wanted to study what were the effects of obsolescence. And the British also tended to exoticize American consumerism, because after the Second World War, they were living in a period of austerity. So there was in Britain a different national context that Bannum and Llewellyn Davies were operating under. So I think that ways of thinking about how change is comprehended and managed in the built environment does have particular national contexts that can have to do with things as, um, um, as banal as tax codes, different lags in the way that consumer society is developing. But I also felt that obsolescence became a worldwide paradigm. It was picked up globally after the Second World War. So there was a consistency, but you should always think about it as multiple obsolescences. There was never one idea of it, and there were also multiple architectures of obsolescence too. There was nothing fixed or essential. It itself was always variable and undergoing change. Does that 
similar. So I guess I see a term like resilience operating at two different levels. Um, one is that I think it's already becoming um, uh, kind of a creative agent for architects, right? The same way that obsolescence at one time, they just believed it. You know, they stopped studying it because no one paid them to study it, whether it was really happening. And it just, we all have to wake up in the morning and have something that excites us. So resilience, I think, is a creative force in that way already. In terms of how it will play out in terms of a larger political economy, I think one difference that's seen is that to make um, our environment resilient, you can't allow individuals to make particular decisions. Uh -huh. It requires huge, large-scale planning. So it's a way, in effect, to bring back the state and government and public policy into the organization of the built environment, rather than what we think of as kind of neoliberalism, which is a kind of opening up to the market. So I think it resilience might be running. Um, it has its own political economy. In terms of it being profitable for businesses and, you know, and architects, it already is, I think, for architects, because they probably go to clients and say, we're going to make your building resilient. And <laughs> they're like, OK, that sounds good. Better, it sounds better than sustainability. It, it, there's obviously going to be a lot of investment and um, uh, put into making places resilient. It could, it could very well be a driver for public and private investment in the built environment going forward. So um, it's a stimulus package or an ideology, too. Uh, above and beyond parts of resilience that are necessary in terms of what we're being confronted. So I, I think those are just some things um, we can see it uh, having those dual roles, how it will play out in the political economy, and particularly how architects will respond to it and use that way of thinking about how change is happening um, and to think about that complexly from a design perspective. Started. Um, so, give another round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks,